Um, so, as you can see, I'm talking about Right to Freedom, the specific online tool that my society developed out of um, Fax Your MP. As many contributions to this conference uh, seem to show, the potential of the internet to increase electoral turnout and to increase civic um, engagement, political participation, and also address the deficits um, in liberal democracy in the relationship between the elected and their electors, that seems to be, you know, continued as a very lively and in a very lively manner, this, this discussion about that potential. And in that discussion, I think we've seen that there are optimists and pessimists and some in between. And that's also a discussion that deals with the issues around liberal democracy. And that's a debate that is always necessary and it's certainly necessary today, given the fact that the liberal model of democracy is under threat, not just by authoritarian thinking, but also by very populist conceptions about democracy, which may in the end result more in the tyranny of the majority um, rather than in the good society. So and I think that the contemporary success of anti-liberalism in any guise has also to do with the perception of the elected, of the representatives as remote, aloof, detached, and that's probably the least of um, the least worst of the, de of the um, labels attached to them. Um, and then for these and other reasons, uh, I think the elected um, is amongst the least trusted professions, amongst, amongst the least trusted persons in many countries. And that raises the question of how members of elected bodies, be they local or supranational in the European Parliament sense, can build a stronger relationship, stronger communicative relationships with citizens. So I use my time here to focus on this question with reference to this particular e-democracy e tool, tool right to them. This is my first attempt, or my, one of my attempts to sort of dabble with the issue of civic technology. Uh, let's see how that goes. First, just a few words on what um, right to them actually is. For those of you who don't know of it, uh, it's a very simple e-democracy tool um, that exists in the UK and I believe also out with the UK. That's how it works. You just put in your postcode and you get uh, contact, or the, you get the, the names um, of your local councillors, of your members of parliament, uh, for example, and then you can choose to contact them uh, in a bunch if there's more than one member of parliament, for example, for your constituency, or one, more than one councillor in your multi, multi councillor ward, uh, or you just contact one of them um, via, via an email. That email gets counted, as far as I understand it, by right to them. Any further exchange between the two sides then happens via normal email and is no longer monitored. So I could choose to contact my local councillor or my member of the European Parliament through this particular tool. Um, on the bottom of the slide, you have my society's general, I suppose, um, mission statement, if you like. Um, at the time when I did the research, and I think um, it shows that my society is on the, opt on, on the optimist side of the spectrum when it comes to the possibilities of the internet to make democracy better. If you see what they're saying, um, it's a digital tool that enables citizens to exert power over institutions and decision makers and so on and so forth. So certainly there is a degree of optimism when it comes to uh, my, so my society's products uh, and also with relation to right to them. <clears throat> Just a bit of further data on right to them that I got from my society's own studies. Um, I'm, hope, I'm very much out of date here with the data, but that's all I could get. The 2010 data shows us who actually gets the messages via right to them. That's the last, uh, the most recent data that I have, but maybe you can educate me here um, on that point. So most data in the UK context go to members of the Westminster Parliament down in London, and then the second most contacted are local councillors, followed by the other category that includes members of the Scottish Parliament and the Irish and Northern Ireland Assembly, and so on and so forth. So that's um, the usage pattern, or parts of it anyway. Uh, my paper, my research, had a particular objective, which is this to empirically analyse based on perceptions of Scottish local councillors and members of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, whether right to them can strengthen interactivity between citizens and the elected and thereby contribute to revitalizing liberal democracy. So my paper, in a sense, I suppose, tries to address the conference's uh, focus on the impact of civic technologies on society. On the slide before this one, you saw that most contacts go to, at least in 2010, went to members of the British Parliament down in Westminster. So why my focus on Scotland? That's where I live, so it just makes practical sense to do 
uh, this focus given my research methods. But also I thought, well, I have to admit here my data is a bit uh, dated on 2014. Um, that year was important for Scotland, given the fact that Scotland had a, had, had a chance to say yes or no to staying within the United Kingdom. Uh, you, know, you know it said no, uh, you know it said yes to staying in the UK. Um, but what was quite remarkable about that year was that people in Scotland were feeling quite political. So people were, in that sense, engaging with politics on this particular, on this, um, on this grand question. So my expectation was that that year would see a good uptake of WTT usage by people in Scotland. Uh, to address this research objective, um, I looked, I chose a particular framework to sort of measure or to sort of put into brackets um, the kinds of communication that are possible. Um, and that is Jan van Dijk's um, four-level uh, matrix, uh, mat uh, four-level matrix on levels of interactivity. This is about, these, these levels describe any kind of interactivity. Um, it could be face-to-face, -face, it could be face-to-face, -face, but via an ICT uh, tool, if you like. Uh, it could be between machines, could be between people and machines. <clears throat> so he distinguishes in his work between uh, four, four levels. They, they accumulate, so the one at the bottom, number four, is the sort of most interactive, if you like. So there's two-way communication where one action requires, uh, leads to one reaction. There's um, synchronous communication, um, where it's an uninterrupted sequence of one reaction following an action. A third level is reached when interactors have a, de have a certain degree of control over their communication, for example, uh, with regards to they could swap their roles, for example, and they can choose any topic uh, they like in their interaction. And the fourth level is reached when interactors share understanding of context. So re that is about uh, actors requiring, or interactors requiring a consciousness, and therefore this level is still reserved to uh, humans and their interactions, following Van Dijk. For, following Van Dijk. So, in other words, these levels start at the very simple, at the very simple level, and then go up to the highest level num at number four. And that could be, but doesn't have to be, uh, ICT mediated. This fourth level of interactivity. Um, just a few words on existing research on WTT. There isn't that much out there, as far as I could tell in my literature research. The research that does tackle it is um, kind of organised according to two, according to two themes, really. Either it's about improving the interactivity, the communication between the two sides, or it is about policing the politician to make for a better democracy, whatever the contradictions may be in that sort of idea about um, whether policing uh, leads to better, um, better democracy. And this paper looks at um, the question of interactivity only, at communication only. Very briefly on the research methods, um, an e-survey with local councillors and members of the Scottish Parliament and um, a few interviews, uh, fewer than I had hoped for, but I think it was a busy time for elected politicians in Scotland in 2014. Um, I start from a very general level here. Um, people, I wanted to hear whether people actually, well, whether my two populations knew about right to them, and you can see that local councillors uh, were, far, were far less aware of its existence than members of the Scottish Parliament. Um, a few bit more basic data uh, in terms of um, whether people were con uh, had been connected in the past and contrary to the earlier data, it seems that members of the Scottish Parliament had received more contacts via this particular tool than local councillors. That's the bar to the right. Um, then I thought I put this question to um, the, my two populations, even though I kind of had a hunch for the answer. Um, councillors tend to, that's all, of course all self-reported data, councillors tend to respond more often personally, personally to WTT contacts than uh, parliamentarians. I, I suppose the latter have more staff at their disposition to kind of handle communication with um, their constituents. So this wasn't really surprising. Um, uh, again, self-reported self response, self response rates here in terms of how many, uh, whether people actually do respond to messages coming in via right to them. And it seems that both populations say, well, of course, we do respond to the large majority of those messages coming in, irrespective of their nature. 
Um, let's see what I can say about um, this you know, question of interactivity and communication between the two sides. Um, I sought to understand what sort of stuff councillors and members of parliament get into their inbox via write to them. I just want, want, to, uh, want to, to, to address a few of those here with those tiny, thin arrows. Apologies for that. The most common type of message that um, local councillors get is that of questions and comments on a local issue. That makes sense. Only, only fairly few requests were about doing something about a particular issue, which was a bit surprising. With MSPs, um, the Scottish parliamentarians, most communication consists of questions and comments on constituency or Scottish issues. So people do make comments on both the things that affect them locally, the constituency, but also talked about them on the larger Scottish issues. There were not many questions for both populations about the political party that either the councillor or the MSP is affiliated to. And it seems that um, both, both that users for both populations, so to speak, um, pitch their email at the right level. So as a citizen who would email the local, local councillors, I would not email them about British issues or Scottish issues, but about local issues. And uh, the same applies to MSPs, and people seem to use the tool in that manner. They didn't um, address too many questions to the local councillor on British politics, for example, um, even though there were some. So to put a bit more colour to the data from the survey, I thought I have some put some interview excerpts on the slide, uh, which show that there maybe is an issue with right to them in terms of its potential to stimulate interactivity between voters or citizens and, um, the, and their representatives. It seems from what I heard from my interviews is that, well, WTT serves as a lobbying tool. So people using a lot this kind of thing that they copy and paste uh, prefabricated messages from larger campaign organizations into the sort of email box on right to them and send that off to their um, MP, uh, MSP or um, local councillor. So one quotation here is by an MSP, people are not really saying what they think on right to them, they're just copying and pasting emails from these larger organizations um, so that they are sent to their um, local councillor or in this case the MSP. A councillor told me that these emails come in sort of blocks, so it depends on some campaign group having an idea to tell its members to do this. WTT is almost entirely campaign-based, was his, I think, opinion. Another MSP said uh, that WTT is ideal for special interest groups trying to generate a pressure of numbers in respect of any issue. Uh, also, I found from what people said to me in the interviews that WTT does not really stimulate much, much exchange or even deliberation on a policy issue. And the MSP told me it tends to be silence after my response because of the campaigns, these copy and paste messages that they um, obtain. But you might get one or two coming back and saying, well, I disagree with you, or they become abusive then. A councillor said to me that you get one email and then you reply and then you lose them at that. Nobody really wants to get into a huge discussion via email. I would not want a discussion like that to happen. Um, further bits of data from the survey. Um, to complement the picture from the interviews, um, I put a number of statements to my respondents uh, to, and asked them to rate these statements, and a few are highlighted here again with barely visible red arrows, so it's not too bad. For example, when I asked um, whether emails coming through right to them have allowed MSPs to get a better insight into issues that may trouble their constituents, whether it builds trust between the two sides or whether it's great for communicating with citizens, the responses were cautiously positive, um, or only cautiously positive on, on these questions. At the same time, it seems that respondents in the two populations, that applies to both um, MSPs and councillors, they didn't feel under undue pressure uh, from messages coming in from um, right to them or under permanent scrutiny. Um, I don't have much time for further detail here, but I think the message is that the that respondents were less positive about the tool than uh, one would have hoped, maybe. But they weren't negative about it either. And the same really applies to local councillors as well. 
so I thought then were to kind of come towards the conclusion of my presentation here, uh, to put this question here, well, does it make a difference at all to the communication between the two sides? Well, I think that from the interviews, again, I gleaned that um, the tool did not foster stronger relationships between voters and or, um, citizens and um, representatives. One councillor told me that right to them has not improved contacts to my constituents. I think getting normal emails, people will happily tell you a story. They then, if you get back to them and say, can you provide me with a contact number and then I can speak with you on, I will do that. I wouldn't do that with right to them because of the tone that I've had so far with some of the communication, with, with some of the emails coming through right to them. Another councillor said that it's like basically filling in a form and going, that's my problem, sort it. It also seems from the interviews that WTT generates more contacts by the well-informed citizens. Um, that goes back, I guess, to the issue of the digital divide or gap. People who write, that's from a councillor again, people, people who write via write to them, they are more political and they are more informed than the average person who just is complaining about their bins. So, to conclude, to summarize very quickly, uh, it seems that citizens make different use or different than intended use of right to them, uh, given this issue that was a big issue in the interviews about the um, pay, copy and paste um, emails. Uh, it doesn't seem to sort of lead to deliberation of policy issues rather than rather the represented inform the representatives about their views, demands and new issues and neither side seems to seek a, dis a discussion via, well, um, in initiated by right to them, an email, an email through it. Uh, it doesn't seem to stimulate personal contacts, only rarely are relationships built, I gleaned from the interviews. And then to answer my research question, uh, it seems to uh, lead to only the first level of interactivity, two-way asynchronous commu communication. And then one, one recommendation to finish off this, uh, this piece, is that um, I heard from councillors and MSPs that they would have appreciated more kind of communication from my society in terms of how does this tool work that um, I am uh, part of by being sort of inserted into the, uh, into the mailing list, if you like. How does it work? How, how is it monitored? Um, how uh, can we avoid any dysfunctions in terms of, well, we get these emails as a councillor, you would get an email from right to them, but in a multi-member member board, all others might get the same email, so all councillors get onto the council offices to get this issue sorted, to get a request. So there's a duplication of, um, of effort on the council side, that kind of stuff. So uh, that was something that I took from the interviews, more communication from my society to those who are meant to be using um, on this side of the spectrum, on this side of the coin, so to speak, right to them would be uh, much appreciated. And that's my time up, I think, as well. Thank you very much.